Good morning and welcome to Moments with Melinda. My name is Melinda Moulton and today my guest is David Martins. Hi, David. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. So you are the new executive director taking Erhard Menke's position at the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. I am. How's that I feel? Am. You're new to Vermont. Yeah, just, yeah, just, uh, just since the end of July. So I got here kind of just in time to enjoy the best part of summer. And, uh, and, and now winter is here and uh, it's gonna be here for a little bit. <laughs> well, and you've, and, and you, I mean, you've only been here since July. So yes. you, you get to get through a Vermont winter, which will be really fun for you. Um, hopefully, hopefully you'll enjoy yeah. it. But look, these are, these are big shoes to fill. So tell us a little bit, because our community does not know you very well. And so I really wanted to, to meet you and interview you for my show to uh, introduce you to the community. Uh, so tell us a little bit about who you are, where you come from. Um, thank you. Sure. So I'm from Rhode Island originally. Um, I'm uh, from a small town called Tiverton is where I grew up. And all of Rhode Island though is like, well, it's like the size of a postage stamp. So like all of Rhode Island is just like one really big town. And so I always ask when people, I always laugh when people say, well, where in Rhode Island? And in my head, I'm like, it doesn't really matter where. <laughs> <laughs> everything's 20 minutes apart you know uh it's only 20 minutes across uh across the whole thing but uh yeah so in college i uh went into the seminary to study to be a catholic priest and uh so i did college uh in the seminary and then i did uh grad school in the seminary and while i was in grad school i decided to leave um because i decided that uh that maybe it just kind of wasn't um the right fit for me. Uh, I'm gay, and that's not. Uh, it doesn't always work. <laughs> Sometimes it can be an additional struggle in the priesthood. So, uh, so I decided to leave, and I went into bartending because, kind of, what else do you do? I guess when you have degrees in philosophy and theology. Uh, so, uh, so I bartended for a number of years. Had a lot of fun, and then um, in 2010, I started working in the nonprofit world. I uh, through a customer. I started working, uh, running a youth leadership program at an LGBT uh, teen center in Providence. And that was sort of my introduction into the nonprofit world. And at the same time, uh, I became affiliated with a church uh, called the Independent Catholic Church. So it's folks who identify themselves as Catholic, but are separated from the formal uh, Roman Catholic Church. And um, they believe in marriage equality and women's ordination and sort of a number of uh, things that separate them from Rome. And I said, well, this is right up my alley. And so I was ordained uh, with that community and opened a church all in 2010. And so then for the next almost decade, I uh, was pastor to that church community and, and grew it. And at the same time was working in the nonprofit world. And I moved from the teen center to working in substance abuse recovery and uh, worked a bit with folks experiencing homelessness. And in the meanwhile, the church kind of started working with the same communities I was working with so that I wasn't like losing my mind going back and forth between the two roles. And uh, the result was a really dynamic faith community that was very involved uh, in the larger community and a ton of experience in advocacy work and community building. And um, so we worked a lot with folks experiencing homelessness. We worked with... Uh, women who are survivors of breast cancer, um, the LGBT community, the recovery community. Um, it was really dynamic and, and busy place. Uh, and so I did that uh, up until 2019. And at that point, I really kind of felt burnt out because it's two full-time jobs and you're only getting paid for one. And uh, I said, I can't do this anymore. And at that point in my life, I thought, well, you know, I enjoy the ministry and working with people. And so maybe there's a place for me uh, still in the, in the Roman church. And so uh, I encountered the Society of St. Edmund who were over at St. Michael's College. And uh, they also had a ministry near me uh, right over the line in Mystic, Connecticut. And so I got to know them a little bit. And uh, that's how I was sort of introduced to Vermont. Um, they hired me to work at uh, one of their ministries in Connecticut, where I uh, was the executive director of uh, recovery uh, ministries and spiritual development at Enders Island in Mystic, Connecticut. I was there for a couple of years, got to know the Edmundites and, and so on. And ultimately, I decided that I wanted to separate myself from 
formal church involvement and just focus on on work and uh but you know it's really it's a small community and so being somewhere where you're only known by an affiliation with church uh is kind of a lot and so i said you know i i want to pack up and i want to move and really start a life for myself you know separated from formal involvement with the church and i had was familiar with the area thanks to the society of st edmund and i said you know what i'll look and see what's going on in vermont and uh and here we are so it's been a it's been quite a road but it's been super exciting to to be here and to uh, you know be meeting new people and uh, everyone's been so welcoming and friendly and uh uh, I don't know if Vermonters are known for their, their friendliness nationally, but they should be because it's certainly been a very, uh, a very positive experience. Well, I'm deeply moved by you. You're a magnificent human being. I am just so well, moved thanks. by the story, David, really. And I'm so glad that you came and landed in Vermont and we so need you. And um, so thank you for choosing Vermont and choosing the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about who might have had the greatest influence on your life to take you into the selfless work that you do. Well, one would uh, definitely be uh, the, the priest at my church when I was growing up. His name was Father Bert Richmond, and he was uh, one of a kind. He was one of these priests who he, he worked just around the clock, 24 seven. Um, and he was not only about he was he was more about living the faith than about shoving it down your throat. And, uh, you know, he I remember I was very involved in the youth group and, you know, he loved every one of us as if we were his own kids. Um, and he just created such a culture there of people who just wanted to be involved. And more than that, he was big on like that. We live that people are, should live their faith by being involved in the bigger community. And uh, and that was just kind of like how he operated and it was that's what really inspired me to go into um <clears throat> to go into ministry and then i think you know in the in the once i got involved in in the nonprofit world you know it was amazing i started meeting people who kind of had the same mentality just minus the church part this attitude of like well i would never want to be a banker or a lawyer not that there's anything wrong with lawyers or bankers but just like i don't want to sit at a desk you know like i want to be out there changing trying to change people's lives and uh there was a um, a gentleman in rhode island his name was jim gillen and jim was like the air hard of the recovery world in rhode island i mean he just lived and breathed it 24 7 he was he defined advocacy uh at the at the state house and in the community and I didn't know him super well, but I, I knew him well enough. And who I did know very well were the people that he inspired and uh, who he worked with directly. Um, and that was just, if you worked in the recovery field in Rhode Island, like there was no other way to approach it. Like that's, it was just known that this work meant that you're always working and that it's not work. It's just life. It's vocation. It's, uh, you know, really kind of what you, this is just what you do and it, and that it's the lens through which you kind of look at the world and uh and that attitude um really sort of helped shape um my understanding of this kind of work and 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 what it means you know and i think for me it, it kind of you know i i don't think you can spend that many years so entrenched in your faith and not have it impact you and uh and to me i i think that like I used to tell the people at the, at the church that, you know, what we do on Sunday morning is an hour. And then there's seven days in the week, 24 hours in each day. So like, you, you know, if you're pious for an hour on Sunday morning, but you jerk the rest of the week, like what's the, what's the point? And, uh, and so really, I think that all of that rolled together is like, just uh, really, I think it's a sense of vocation, really like that. Um, that this is just the kind of work that uh, just feels right. It's your you know? life. It's your life. Yeah. It's selfless. It's selfless giving of yourself to serve others. And isn't that really what Christianity is all about? Yeah, it's supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It's kind of taking a loop here and there. But um, 
So tell our viewers uh, a little bit about the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. Tell us a little bit about the organization and the history of it. The, the coalition is um, a coalition of 90 plus organizations um, that uh, basically, uh, I mean, Erhard. <laughs> Erhard is what the coalition does. Uh, you know, the, that presence at the, uh, presence at the state house really doing advocacy work um, to try to move forward policy and uh, legislation that's going to help develop more affordable housing uh, within the state. And, um, you know, Erhard also did a lot of work with the coalition to end homelessness. Uh, upon him taking over his new role, both coalitions have really sort of taken time to say, well, what do we really, what do we do? And how are we distinct from one, from other housing organizations? How are we distinct from each other? And so um, a big piece of our focus is really on this idea of affordable housing and that while homelessness is certainly involved in the issue of affordable housing, they are in fact two different issues um, in that if folks can't find affordable housing, they end up homeless. And the only solution to homelessness is affordable housing. So um, we're really kind of distinguishing ourselves and yet, also making sure to point out the intrinsic relationship between the two, if that makes any sense. It does, uh, and poverty. I mean, poverty is a big issue too. If you don't have money, course. you can't afford And what's happening today in Vermont, especially in Burlington, is the housing costs have gotten so high that people can't afford to live here. Yep. There's been a gentrification. And so how do you address that? It's an issue of, you know, it's a multi-layered issue. It's an issue of, of um, you know, for sure, poverty. Um, also, just that we have such an old housing stock. I mean, that's the to start with, right? That the properties we do have that are available that people are renting is old and it needs upgrades. Um, and then, you know, we have the, this low vacancy rate. Then we have, of course, all the as folks are sort of colloquially saying the the COVID refugees, right? The folks that kind of came up here during the pandemic. And all of these things just drive that market higher and higher and higher. And, uh, and it makes it, it, it just, it's like layers of an onion that just further complicate this issue. And so there's really no one solution. It's a multi-layered, it's a, uh, you know, multi, multi-faceted situation. And the, you know, even for that matter, even just to end poverty, like, right, like we have, there's organizations all over the world about ending poverty. Let's, there's no magic wand. No. There's no button. Because all of these issues are multi-layer and all these issues are intertwined. So is um, a lot of your job advocacy, are you going to be, are you like, I know Earhart was down the legislature a lot. I mean, a lot of your job is advocacy to find the mm -hmm. funding and the support to be able to do the work of these 90 organizations that, I mean, there's right now, there's 1,500, you know, homeless families in Burlington. Um, I think somebody told me recently it uh, there. So is a lot of your job advocacy too, to, because it has to start with where do we get the money to create the housing? And, mm -hmm. and in many ways, I think, I think housing sh should be, I mean, this is me, but I just think that people should be given places to live for free. I mean, at the end of the day, if they can't afford it, that at the end of the day, that, so what, what, how do you feel about that? I mean, if people can't afford to, you know, to rent a house or to own a house and the affordable housing rates are too high, we should be building buildings to put people in so that they're warm and, and safe and they're getting the services that they need. And I know that COTS is doing this with other organization, but where where do you fall on that? Yeah, and so, I mean, safe, decent, affordable housing is a, is a right. It's a human right. And, uh, and, and, and we have to, we have to provide that for, for folks who can't, um, who, who can't access that. And so how and do I we think, do that? Yeah, I mean, because now the, I mean, the, whole, the whole Sears Lane um, debacle yeah. where folks had to leave Sears Lane and there was, there, you know, there was a lot of, um, you know, uh, uproar on, on both sides of that issue. But where do people go? Um, yeah. And it's sort of like, you know, well, like with Sears Lane, I mean, like if your neighbor was, if they found out that your neighbor was, you know, manufacturing drugs in his basement, they wouldn't evict your whole street. <laughs> they, you know, they would deal with the person who broke the law. And, uh, but I think that the, um, 
you know, all of what we do really is advocacy because advocacy is more than just the presence at the state house. It's also, I think, community advocacy. It's giving voice to the folks on Sears Lane uh, who have been displaced. It's giving voice to the folks, uh, you know, in the motel hotel program. It's giving voice to the folks that we that are on the streets um, and giving vo voice to the folks who uh, also are sort of what you know what we're calling the missing middle, folks who are not qualified as low income and don't live in any kind of subsidized uh, housing, but can't afford housing. Like there are nurses who can't afford housing, like, uh, you know, folks that, but also a lot of these folks don't qualify for assistance. Um, and so sort of end up in the same kind of nightmarish situation. And it all goes back to this multi-layered um, sort of uh, multi-layer and multi-intersectional problem. Well, I mean, uh, you have to, and then you have to add mental, you know, mental illness too. That we don't have enough therapists to serve people who need to, who need care. Yeah, um, addiction. We, so, we don't. Have, there's not enough addiction. Um, so there's your onion. There's yeah. Your onion. So in your new job, this is this is a big job. And you're kind of like at the at the at the core of that onion, at the root of that onion, to help uh, to help deal with this this issue, and it's happening all over the country. Um, and so, talk to us a little bit about some of the things that, that your organization is doing to help alleviate this problem. Sure. sure. So as as we come in, uh, we come into the new legislative session. So in about a month, a lot of my time is going to be absorbed in Montpelier. This uh, you know advocacy for legislation that. Would, would help alleviate some of these problems. You know, uh, some of the complications around the housing issue is that you say, well, you just put a house, you just put up a building. But like, you know, there are zoning things that get in the way. There are uh, uh, complications overfolding with Act 250 that get in the way. There's, uh, you know, I mean, you name it. And so uh, there's is some of that solution is legislative. And so, you know, some advocacy uh, around that stuff, advocacy around um, rental housing safety. We know that last year uh, the rental housing safety bill was vetoed after it was passed. So a big thing we'll be doing this year is working on, you know, finding another solution uh, to that. Um, there's some legislation around recovery housing that we'll be uh, that we'll be working on, and a lot of legislation around money um, because right now, because of um, some different funding that came in as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, there's an unprecedented amount of money uh, available right now, which is fantastic. But all of that money is still, even if we spent every single cent of it on housing, it's still not enough to solve the problem. Um, but it's a down payment. It's a down payment on a, on a decade-long investment. It's something. Yeah. And it's a down payment on our future, I think, really, as a state, because you know, I mean, these are our neighbors, and uh, and and not only is it our neighbors, it's us, right? It's because all of us are paying for housing. So, like, it's a um, it's an issue that really and truly does impact everyone. So, so that legislative piece is uh, is one big part of what we do. Another big part of what we do is trying to um, have this conversation about affordable housing with as many communities as possible to shed light on the fact that this impacts all of us, particularly communities who we may not often think about. So like, for example, in October, we did some programming around how the housing crisis impacts early childhood development. Um, in November, we did some stuff around how veterans are impacted by the housing crisis. This month, we'll be um, you'll see some stuff coming out from us about folks living with HIV and AIDS and how the housing crisis impacts them in a particular way. Vermont has one of the best systems of care for folks living with HIV and AIDS. So people come to Vermont for that and then can't find housing. Um, and so, um, you know, all, all, there's as many communities as there are people, right? Like that, that we could point to. And that's what we really want to do um, is to really highlight. And that's an important piece of advocacy because it's a two-way street. It's us helping folks see, you know, the average Joe who, um, you know, works a, you know, a decent job and makes a decent living and and can, you know, but having that 
missing middle piece, right? He's paying twice as much for rent than he should and happens to be living with HIV and AIDS or, or AIDS. Like for that person to be like, this issue impacts my community in a particular way. Um, and also for us to, at the state house thing, to be able to give voice to that reality to lawmakers to say, you know, people living uh, with HIV, the housing crisis impacts their health in this way. It impacts early childhood development in this way. It means that our veterans are experiencing this or that. It means, right? Um, so it all goes together. Um, trauma, trauma. Yeah, yeah. And um, another piece we're doing that we're real excited about is really trying to bring together young people, particularly like college age folks and recent grads, um, to bring them to the table really in an organized way, as much like we really want to kind of build a, um, I don't know what you want to call it, a group, I guess, um, of collegiates who would be members of the coalition and therefore would have a voice in us shaping our priorities. And then once we get past this legislative session, um, we'll move on and I'll have almost a year under my feet. Um, so we'll then sort of be more involved with legislators, hopefully in the crafting of policy and in, and in um, you know, looking over what we did this year, what we accomplished this year in the legislature, what needs to be done, um, bringing all these housing organizations together um, so that they can inform us, well, here are some gaps and this is what we would need to do this and how do we work towards solutions. And, and hopefully through all of our conversations with these other communities, like the HIV AIDS community, veterans, LGBT. Disability, the disability community. Yeah, folks with disability, right? That hopefully in doing that, we also can help build those intersectional solutions. Now, have, now, one of the things that we've done down here, of course, was inclusionary zoning, where we were, where Burlington requires 25% of your project to be affordable housing, which we did back in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. um, it would be great if all communities adopted an inclusionary zoning um, ordinance that would require people doing housing to make sure that 25% of the homes that they're building are affordable. Yeah. And there, I mean, there are so many, it's interesting that I think that it's a uniquely difficult problem in Vermont, just because of the nature of, you know, so we have like, like Rhode Island, for example, Rhode Island's the size of a postage stamp and a million people live inside that postage stamp. Vermont has a half a million people and it's way bigger than a postage stamp. And, um, you know, distance between communities, uh, sort of the, uh, the vast difference in density, the, um, you know, farm worker housing, that's a unique issue here. Like, so you have these big old farms, right? And uh, the farmers are not doing as well as they once were. They have housing on the farm for the farm workers because it's sort of part of their compensation, but that housing needs to be upgraded or the farm workers live off the farm but aren't making enough money to be able to afford the housing. Yeah. And there's not affordable housing options in these towns that are out in the middle of nowhere where the farms are. It's not like there's farms in the middle of Burlington, the farm, right? The farms well, are out. well, we have the Intervale. We do have a right. big yeah. have the Intervale yeah. Center. Yeah. Um, but um, so I'm, I, we only have a few more minutes here. I am just fascinated. I could talk to you forever. I am so thrilled. Um, Erhard Menke deserved to have David Martin step into his shoes. That's all I have oh, to say. Thanks. Uh, thanks. No, really, thanks so I, I have so I'm so enjoying talking with you. I could talk to you forever. I want to remind our viewers that we're talking to David Martins, who is the new executive director of the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. You can go to their website at vtaffordablehousing.org. I encourage you to make a donation to this organization. Uh, and to go to their website and um, and and see what they're doing. You're doing remarkable work. So what what can we as Vermonters, what can we do to help you in your work, David? What can we do? A donation at the website certainly would, wouldn't hurt. <laughs> we are, uh, all of our work is funded through donations and through uh, the dues that are paid by our formal members. So, so any help in that regard would be great. Uh, however, I do, you know, housing is everyone's, issue. And so everyone can be a part of the solution. And I think that one thing that every single Vermonter can do is to be aware of, you know, what I've been saying to people that, that we talk about affordable housing, really, that means that when I pay for my housing, 
rent, mortgage, utilities, that it is 30% or less of my income. Mm -hmm. That's true for all of us. And so when you're tempted to think a certain way about a person experiencing homelessness, like everyone from the, the, the poorest of the poor to the richest of the rich, what's 30, 30% is 30%. And I think that that concept is very unifying um, and reminds us that we all sit at this table together and that, you know, that we're all working on this, uh, on this issue together. And, and the other thing is that when people, I think sometimes people hear the phrase affordable housing, they automatically think of homelessness or they think of the poorest of the poor, but it's everyone. And so a big part that every Vermonter can do um, is to, is to key into that. And, uh, you know, it, it, no one should think like, well, this issue doesn't, this isn't my issue. This doesn't apply to me because it does. And as we all know, it, all it takes is one small tragedy and your place on that scale can easily change. Well, in every, every conference I've been to, the number one thing that pops up is affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Number one. And yep. it's been like that for five years. On the Poverty Council, it, it pops up all the time. And folks who really want to kind of go the extra mile, I think shooting an email to your legislator or a phone call to your legislator, if you're comfortable with it, telling them the importance of, especially around uh, rental rental housing, rental housing safety, that oh. you know that we need to do work on rental housing safety, on on um, providing an avenue for um, assuring that housing is safe. It's not just affordable, but safe and decent. Getting a roof over someone's head isn't the whole answer. Have you read, have you read the book Evicted yet? I have, yeah. Yeah, you have. Okay. Um, I'm part of the Williston Restorative Justice Center, so we're we're immersed in all of this right now, talking about how do we create. And I think we all do probably move towards primarily to homelessness because that's where the suffering is. But you're mm -hmm. absolutely right. Um, and we do not want to lose the middle here in Vermont. We do not mm -hmm. want to become a gentrified state. Mm -hmm. um, so, and also- and we, don't want to, and we don't want to think that, you know, I mean, like the housing, the, um, the hotel motel program, fantastic. Like we, we took all these folks experiencing homelessness and gave them shelter and safety during the pandemic, but they are still experiencing homelessness. Those hotels are not a home. No. It's a shelter. And so and it's very listen. easy, though, and tempting to sit back and say, oh, we solved this. No, we did well, not. Well, we put a Band-Aid on it. Of course we didn't solve it. That's not the way to solve it. And I think we really need to look at our property taxes, too, because we're putting people out of their homes. Mm -hmm. And we have to look at our health care, because health care, I mean, you get one, you know, one major medical illness and you don't have the insurance to cover it, you can end up on the street. I mean, every mm -hmm. like you said, all of us are just a step away from 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 not having a home. So I, I we're coming to the end of my of my show. And um, I've been very moved by you. I when as soon as we can get out in public, I want to go have or whenever you want, I would love to have lunch with you. Yeah, for sure. I meet you face to face and really get deeper into some of these issues and these subjects. Um, I want to thank you for coming to Vermont and for choosing us. Um, we're so delighted to have you, and I'm so happy to learn more about you. Um, and again, to my viewers, uh, the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition, um, visit their website at vtaffordablehousing.org and make a donation. And, and David, let me know if there's anything I can do to help. If you need somebody down, I mean, I am, you know, I, I have created buildings. And so if you ever need somebody down in the legislature to speak at a committee or whatever, and I'm, I've been immersed in this for a long time, but all of us in this community put our arms around you and want to have you succeed in the work that you do because it's so important. And so thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I add your name to my list, my go-to list. Please do. All right. And to my viewers, I'm going to say goodbye to you. This moment with Melinda has been fabulous with David Martins and I will see you soon. <laughs>